Germany invaded Norway in April 1940 and defeated the Nordic nation in a 62-day campaign. But many Norwegians continued to serve the Allied war effort, serving from Allied countries like the United Kingdom and Canada as part of the Free Norwegian Forces or at home as part of the Norwegian resistance. But it was a group of Norwegian civilians who had arguably the largest impact on the war. In fact, some have argued that without them, the Allies would have lost the war. The Norwegian government in exile formed the Norwegian Shipping and Trade Commission, called Nortraship, to manage the Norwegian merchant fleet, and their little-remembered contribution was a vital part of the Allied war effort. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On the night of April 9th and 10th, 1940, German forces attacked Norway. The Norwegians were largely caught off guard, although they did sink the German flagship Blücher, and this delayed the Germans long enough for the royal family, government, and treasury to escape from Oslo. The Norwegian government in exile was headquartered in London, and Norwegian forces served admirably throughout the war. But Norway's greatest contribution to the war effort wasn't in strength of arms, but in tonnage of ships. When Germany invaded, hundreds of Norwegian-owned ships were scattered across the world. In the interwar years, Norway's merchants had purchased dozens of new ships, turning their fleet into the fourth largest in the world, and one considerably newer than anyone else's. As much as 65% of the Norwegian ships were less than 10 years old, only 22% of U.S. ships and just 7% of the U.K. merchant ships were that new. Norway held almost a fifth of the world's total tanker capacity. In all, the Norwegian fleet had some 4.8 million gross registered tons at its disposal. The relationship between Norway and Britain didn't start with the invasion. In World War I, Norway had been called the neutral ally thanks to its technical neutrality but British favoring policies during the war. Norway declared neutrality in September of 1939, but their position was always tenuous. The first Norwegian ship to sink was the MS Ronda, which hit a mine on September 13, 1939. They had trade relationships with both Germany and the United Kingdom, but Norway relied much more on trade from the UK, which provided grain, oil, and coal, and controlled dozens of international ports. Leadership in London knew that war would require much greater shipping capacity. With war with Germany looming, they hoped to gain control of, or at least cooperation with, the Norwegian fleet. Before they'd even entered the war, Norway and the United Kingdom had come to terms on the Scheme Agreement, which promised a percentage of the Norwegian fleet to sail under British charter, including about two-thirds of the tanker tonnage. In exchange, the Norwegians were promised important commodities necessary to keep the country functioning. In order to maintain Norwegian neutrality, the agreement was officially negotiated by the Norwegian Shipowners Association. During the seven months after the war began and the invasion of Norway, more than 50 Norwegian ships and some 400 crew were lost to German hunting. Denmark and the Netherlands both refused to sign similar agreements. Norway's neutrality was doomed from the start. Norway was especially valuable because it controlled a major supply of iron, especially from northern Sweden, that the Third Reich needed. On the same day it invaded Norway, the Nazis invaded Denmark, and a month later Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France. Forces in Norway fought on until the 10th of June, longer than any other invaded country in the early part of the war. But by then, the UK was busy dealing with the collapse of Allied defenses in France. The founding of Nortraship itself occurred in a flurry of activity after the invasion. Twelve days after the invasion, Royal Mandate had confirmed government requisition of the entire merchant fleet, otherwise privately owned by Norwegian shipowners, many of whom were still stranded in Norway. On the 23rd, Norwegian government officials were dispatched to London, with control of the merchant fleet to be given to Ivand Lorentzen, a shipowner in charge of the shipping directorate. By the time they reached London, they found that much of the preparatory work had already been completed by Norway's minister there and Ingolf Hissing Olsen of the Shipowners Association. In fact, the offices at 144 Ledenall Street opened four hours before Lorentzen's arrival. Later, they would open other offices outside the city and in New York. Shortly after Norway fell, the Germans took over radio in Oslo and broadcast to the Norwegian merchant fleet that they were to make for neutral ports or to return home to Norway, but not to go to any British ports. The BBC immediately radioed out a counter-order inviting the Norwegian vessels to come to Allied ports for safety, where they would be welcomed and receive compensation for their services. The creation of Nortraship was highly contested. The British still wanted to simply take control of the fleet, but the Free Norway government wanted to maintain its control and its independence. Without the merchant fleet, Free Norway had no means of supporting itself or its armed forces. 
One of the sticking points was who should insure the fleet, but after a few days and an incredibly short negotiation, the British were able to telegram captains that your ship is held covered by the British government against war and marine risks on the values and conditions under which she is at present insured. It was a remarkable achievement, apparently in less than an hour, mostly through Lloyds, without knowing where the ships were or what they carried. Admirably, not a single Norwegian ship obeyed the Nazi broadcast from Oslo. The fleet comprised around a thousand ships, from ocean liners and tankers to Norway's whaling fleet. It was one of the largest merchant fleets in the world and called itself the world's largest shipping company. Their position was fairly unique. Denmark, which had surrendered, had its ships essentially commandeered by the British, but Norway's government remained intact. Many of the decisions by Norway and Norcher ship can be viewed through the dual lens of short-term military goal and long-term financial ones. They were called Allied and Competitor. As one book called it, they served for patriotism and profit. Before the U.S. entered the war, Norwegian ships not chartered to the British took advantage of high market rates for shipping from the U.S. When the U.S. entered, months of negotiation eventually led to the Hogmanay Agreement, in which the Norwegian negotiator fought hard for Norwegian interests against both of the Allies. During the war, almost 90% of Norwegian government revenue came from Norcher ship. The Norwegian ships sailed mostly in the North Atlantic, the most dangerous shipping theater of the war, although they served throughout the Mediterranean and the Pacific as well. The quasi-private entity ran successfully, but not without some significant internal frictions. Powerful private and government personalities faced off, especially that of appointed Lorentzen and Hising Olsen, who represented the ship owners. The problem was partially solved when Lorentzen was sent to the U.S. to deal with free ships, ones not chartered to an ally, and disagreements over who should keep the earnings from such shipping. The government stepped in to say that New York and London offices were parallel offices that ran their own ships. In the U.S., several free ship owners continued to cause problems. One of the largest was Thomas Olsen, who insisted that he was most qualified to manage his own ships. One Norwegian government official called Olsen's acts bordering on high treason. Those ships owned by ship owners who served in Norcher ships certainly faced the moral dilemma of making decisions that might benefit them personally. Lorentzen himself received criticism, especially for continuing to run a line of his own ships in South America and appointing his son to a position in the New York office. Arling Dekenes, who negotiated the Hogmanay Agreement, was viewed suspiciously because he flew his own ships under foreign, mostly Panamanian, flags. In 1941, Norwegian ship owners formed an association to defend their interest. Partially, they feared that the government intended to nationalize shipping after the war, which the Norwegian government denied. There was also the issue of payment. Before the invasion, Norwegian crews received a 300% hazard pay. Afraid the pay difference would affect the morale of other Allied crews, Britain demanded that UK merchants and Norwegian ones be compensated equally once they joined the war. Eventually, Norwegian crews were promised only slightly higher rates. Joining the war, however, was dangerous. In the summer after the invasion, losses skyrocketed. In the next nine months, Norway lost 96 ships to enemy action and began to have problems crewing their ships. Norway negotiated for higher wages to offset the difficulties, first in 1941 and then again in 1942. The British continued to push for chartering all Norwegian vessels, but ultimately only took control of about 75%. These ships were vital. They helped to pull enormous amounts of lend-lease equipment across the ocean, to England and France, and then later to the Soviets, as well as tons of oil, gas, and food. It was also highly profitable for Norway. Shipping always comes at a premium in war, and Norcher ship earned around 4.5 billion Norwegian kroner during the war, most of which was from shipwreck compensation, the rest directly from trade. Most of that money went to the ship owners for losses, but around 800 million kroner came back to the government, more than the entirety of their rescued treasury. In 1964, the government estimated the financial contribution from Norcher ship to Norwegian society to amount to 1.2 billion kroner. When the decision was made to cut the Norwegian sailors' hazard pay, the UK continued to pay the same amount to Norway, with the difference being paid in a separate account, now called the Secret Fund. There seems to have been an understanding that this money would be paid to the sailors after the war, however this was not to be. After the war, the Norwegian government decided that 43 million kroner fund should be dispersed to the widows and children of seafarers that had died, as well as those disabled during the service. Sailors, however, were already pressing in court for their own claims to the money. The sailors' case was thrown out by the Norwegian Supreme Court in 1954. That wasn't the only example of poor treatment for Norcher ship sailors. Some of the sailors had been gone so long that they were removed from voter rolls, while others were forced to do compulsory military service, their service aboard the merchant fleet deemed insufficient. 
Many of the sailors suffered PTSD called War Sailor Syndrome, but were given much smaller pensions than soldiers who had been held in Norway during the war. Some politicians even argued they deserved no pension at all. Up to the 1960s, war sailors and their families had to prove their problems were a direct result of the war. It wasn't until 1968 that the burden was reversed and the government had to prove that the problems were not caused by the war. It wasn't until 2013 that the Norwegian Minister of Defense issued an apology. The story of our war sailors is a shocking narrative about a society that was not properly prepared to take care of some of the biggest war heroes, he said. The war sailors were eventually given money in 1969, amounting to 180 kroner per month the sailors served. One author writes that for the majority of the Norwegian population in Norway during the German occupation, the war years were a challenge of the more prosaic kind. Norwegian sailors and the Norwegian ship fleet had a different wartime experience. They were at war. Of the 1,000 ships and the 30,000 sailors that served at the beginning of the war, more than 500 ships were lost, and some 3,600 sailors died, along with about 1,000 foreign crew members. About 10% of the total shipping tonnage lost in the war was Norwegian. The 3,600 dead made up a full third of total Norwegian casualties during the Second World War. Norwegian ship provided valuable service to the Allies during the war, providing supplies to both Britain and to Russia. A 1942 U.S. diplomatic memorandum noted that in 1941, 40% of all oil and gas and 30% of all foodstuffs sent from the Western Hemisphere to England were sent on Norwegian ships. Their role should not be understated, nor the risks that they faced. They served primarily in the most dangerous sea theater of the war, the North Atlantic, facing the dreaded German U-boats at the height of their hunting. British politician Philip Noel Baker, who served after the war as the Minister of Fuel and Power, said, if we had not had the fleet of Norwegian tankers on our side, we should not have had the aviation spirit to put our Hawker Hurricanes and our Spitfires into the air. Without the Norwegian merchant fleet, he argued, Britain and the Allies would have lost the war. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.